Um, yeah, Lauren. And then I'm back. Um, I have a good excuse, guys. I do have a very good excuse, which is, um, um, which is, uh, I actually my Linux laptop was actually owned by Novell, and I have to return it this week. Oh. Ooh. Um, I am uh, I am technically unemployed at this point, um, but uh, we're launching a startup to continue working on the Mono project, uh, even without Novell support. So. Technically, this logo is owned by Novell, so I don't know if I can use this in the future, but, uh, but you know, I don't think they're going to sue me for this. So. Anyways, the, um, when we started the Mono project, our goal, uh, we started Mono in 2001, although I started prototyping it in December of 2000. And uh, at the time, we were working on a small startup called Zimian, uh, based, uh, based here in Cambridge, very close. Uh, nearby, and we're building uh, we're building Linux for the desktop applications. We built Evolution, and we built uh, a lot of the GNOME infrastructure that is in use today, and a lot of those components. So uh, back then, we were thinking the year of the Linux desktop is only five years away, four years away. It was going to be the year of the Linux desktop any minute now. So uh, in the first year of our development, we we had been doing GNOME for a couple of years, since 1997, so it's been, by that time, it's four years into GNOME, and we're suffering a lot with C. Uh, the scripting languages are really not uh, very useful at this point. Remember, this is the year 2000, so Python is really out of the question for building desktop apps. It's too heavy, machines don't have enough RAM. And Microsoft came out with this thing called the uh, .NET, and they published the specs for uh, the language, and they published the specs for the virtual machine, and we we thought this is this is very neat. This is very nice, and we would like to. We had a little bit of a, a jealousy problem there. It's, uh, we thought they were getting a lot of tools that we didn't have, and also the uh, Java was a little bit in disarray in Linux. There were there was a Sun Java implementation. Uh, it was just getting baked. Uh, it was coming out of a of a fairly bumpy start with the Blackdown implementation. I don't know if you guys remember, but it was a third-party independent, non-certified version of Java. And um, and the people that actually did the port were forbidden from working on an open source version one. So people that rushed to help Sun port the stuff, since they had been contaminated, they couldn't work on an open source implementation. So, uh, so it was a little bit rough there. And there were a couple of open source implementations going on, but it didn't really, uh, it didn't really map to what we we're trying to do at the time. So we decided to start a mono project, and uh, and we open source. We, we did it as an open source project, which meant that we got we did we certainly pushed money in a direction, but a lot of people came and took it in the wrong directions. We were very focused at the time on just doing Linux on the desktop, and that was the only thing we cared about. We cared about GTK. Remember, in the in the fight between the desktops between uh, GNOME and KDE, we were very set on the GNOME camp. So we built bindings to GTK. Uh, a binding is a, a little piece of glue that allows you to develop using C Sharp and consume a particular library. In this case, it was a GUI library called GDK. Uh, we call this GDK Sharp. So that was all we wanted to do. But as people came in, they added uh, database support from Microsoft. They added ASP.NET. They added Windows Forms. They added all kinds of things. And Mono kept growing as a project, um, and it has been, has been growing ever since. So the evolution was a little bit. Uh, we did Linux on the desktop and as it became useful on the server, uh, we did Linux on the server, more as part of Novell, uh, and we did that for a while. And in the last uh, two years, we did uh, Mono for mobile devices. So that's roughly the genesis of the project. Um, we're going to have a conference uh, hosted in, uh, um, in a couple of weeks in July here at the Microsoft Nerd Center. This is the, uh, this is the building uh, that is a couple of blocks away, I guess it's oh, what is that way? east. East from here. Yeah. Right by the entrance to Memorial Drive. Right. So uh, Microsoft Nerd Center actually hosts a bunch of people. Uh, oddly enough, they host every Python, PHP, Ruby group in town, uh, MySQL <laughs> group in town. So we're going to have our, uh, our, our conference there. Uh, we haven't had one in about four years uh, for all kinds of reasons. But anyways, uh, kind of what we wanted to do is, although we initially uh, set out to build .NET for Linux, uh, we, uh, we went beyond that. And uh, today, probably one of our largest platforms is the Mac, uh, just because everybody has a Mac, and we're building applications for the Mac, and 
people can put apps in the App Store with Mono. So, so uh, you know, we're very excited about that. Uh, but we, we were not really limited to that. It's being used for embedded devices. Um, it powers about uh, 1,500 games on the Apple App Store. 20% um, of the top 10 of the top 10 games on the App Store are all built uh, um, uh, with uh, with Mono. Um, uh, this, when I say top 10, it's because it's rolling. Right, every couple of months there's a different top 10. So uh, Mono consistently is uh, is two out of the top 10 games. Uh, mono for the Wii, Mono for PlayStation 3, um, for the Android, and all kinds of other <coughs> devices. So, um, and I'll get a little bit to what, why we think it's, it's very interesting, uh, what we've done there, why people like this. But um, at, the core, um, at the core of Mono, there's, there's this thing called the Common uh, Language Runtime, the CLR. And the CLR is a virtual machine, very much like the Java virtual machine or the JavaScript virtual machine. The, uh, the difference between this virtual machine and others is that uh, it was when they originally designed it, they brought in people from multiple uh, backgrounds in language programming. So although the lingua franca of, of .NET is, uh, and the CLR is C-sharp, and that's what most people use, what they did initially was uh, they had this thing called Project 7. And Project 7 were, were seven commercial compilers and seven research compilers. And the idea was to make sure that the CLR was able to run all of these languages together. So they had, a, uh, they had a Haskell implementation, they had a Lisp implementation, they had COBOL implementation, Fortran implementations. Uh, the COBOL and Fortran uh, compilers still exist and they're, uh, they're commercial, uh, so you can still buy them today. And uh, so the idea was basically to make sure that the VM uh, wasn't like the JVM that worked fine for Java but couldn't really host efficiently C, couldn't really host efficiency C++ or Fortran or COBOL uh, or other research languages. So from the beginning, the virtual machine was designed to host all of these uh, things at the same time. The, so that's probably the most important thing. It was, a, is a, it was a VM designed for multiple language support. Now, if you want to be pedantic enough, the x86 instruction <coughs> is also an instruction set that can host any language. For that matter, anything that is you know that looks like a computer can host any language. The question is whether you can host it efficiently. Right, so somebody approved that send mail macros were uh, Turing complete, and you can technically generate, you, you can run anything through send mail macros and it will run. Right, the question is whether it's efficient or not. Uh, and today I was talking about this JavaScript uh, uh, x86 emulator running on the browser, which is beyond unbelievable. But it, it boots Linux and you can run compilers and Emacs and the whole thing in the browser. But anyways. Um, the, the idea here was to make it efficient, to support uh, running multiple languages efficiently. And this resonated with the, what we're trying to do with GNOME, which was we were trying not to tie ourselves too hardly to C. We wanted to make sure that people could use higher level languages because you're more productive in a high level language than a low level language. So this resonated very much with us. It's, remember, this is the year 2001. But what we wanted basically was to bring the best tools to Linux. That really was what we wanted to do. Make sure the Linux had a, a, a world-class uh, uh, tools for building software. And uh, remember, again, the year 2000, uh, Linux on the desktop is going to be, we're going to be everywhere. It's going to be in millions and millions of computers. Uh, these days, I joke that 2008 was the year of the Linux desktop. Uh, you know, we're already past that point, and now we're uh, on our way out. I guess, uh, I guess Linux uh, will survive in the shape or, or in the form of a Chrome. I mean, for the mass consumer market, Chrome OS and, uh, and Android. So anyways, uh, for the longest time, we've been catching up to, the, to Microsoft. It's, uh, it's been a lot of work to make sure that we're compatible with Microsoft, that we have the features that Microsoft has, and the developers can move their code back and forth. And, and initially, we had to do this just from their documentation. A couple of years ago, we we sign an agreement, the Vel signed an agreement with Microsoft where Microsoft would give us access to their test suites. <coughs> so starting around the year 2008, maybe maybe 2007, maybe 2007, we got the equivalent of the TCK for Java. Uh, so we could make sure that our class libraries were compatible, that our virtual machine was compatible, or at least that it was as compatible as the Microsoft own test suites uh, showed. These test suites were not really designed like the TCK for compliance. They were mostly internal regression tools, so they're not on the same level of 
quality, but uh, but they're you know they're very close and uh, and that helps us improve mono. But in the meantime, we started doing a little bit of uh, embrace and extending ourselves, um, and uh, we've we've done a lot of things. These are just a couple of things, and it's just is the things that we I picked at the conference in 2008, the Professional Developer Conference, um, where we presented uh, uh, mono. And um, usually the story of mono was kind of boring. You know, you show up at a Windows conference and you say, it's .NET, but in Linux. And that was pretty much it, right? And the rest was Q&A. How did you run this? How do you, right? But by 2008, we had done a couple of things that were, uh, that were starting to deviate extensively. One of them were uh, the CIMD extensions. And, that, and what we did is that we mapped specific classes. Uh, in particular, these are the class are called vector 4 f vector uh, 8, uh, F, no, 8F, 4F, 4D, no, 2D. Anyways, all the SIMD uh, native operations that you have in your CPU, we map those to uh, high level types. So just like you trade an int or a float or a double, you could trade vectors. So 16 byte vectors or uh, eight uh, uh, or uh, vectors of eight shorts or four integers or two longs, uh, an equivalent for floating point. So we surface those things into into the virtual machine. Uh, and the reason we did that was because roughly around this time, uh, what happened was very interesting. The, the game industry started using mono for their games. And the way that that happened was because uh, most game developers spend a lot of their time optimizing their engine, uh, pushing the GPU, <coughs> making sure that you can get as many uh, polygons per second on the screen. But when it comes to the AI of a game, uh, the thing that controls the script, that controls the dude that hunts you down, the, 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 when he lifts the, the rifle and shoots at you, uh, the way that he decides where you are, uh, the display uh, that shows how many bullets you have left, uh, the camera that tracks you as you move, uh, the other cameras for the other players, the network access, all of this. All of those things tend to be written in a scripting language. So the hardcore developers will write everything in assembler, C++, or even SPU assembler code, and uh, and they would do all of that. And then the actual AI gets tested by a separate team of people. So it's a team that is not necessarily low level. It's a team that uh, doesn't know that you need to free something you malloc, uh, that you can do something after it's been freed, uh, that you can not really uh, override the memory. You know, it's not the same level of expertise. They're higher level programmers, and, and they're mostly interested about gameplay. Uh, they think in different terms. They think about. Was this fun? Was it not fun? How hard was it? Uh, is the user going to get frustrated if he gets uh, if he gets uh, slaughtered immediately? Uh, so they have to tune parameters like how quickly he's going to get slaughtered, or you know, uh, he needs to develop his skills to actually make it through the level. So they they think in different terms, and these people were really not comfortable with doing C plus plus or assembly language to do this kind of thing. So hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Uh, so. So what happened is that the game industry adopted scripting languages for the longest time, and one of those languages was Lua. Uh, Lua is very, very popular in the game industry. A handful of people have used Python. There are, there is also a very popular language called um, uh, Unreal Script for Unreal Engine. So basically, many of the big, large engines build their own C-like scripting language, and they would embed it in the games. And the problem with this, uh, with this, with this language is that they pose multiple problems. The first one is, each one, everybody has their own scripting language. Even in the case of Lua, uh, developers go and, and tune the Lua engine. They make some changes. They rip it out. They add features. They remove features. Uh, people don't tend to use stock Lua in the game industry. Uh, <coughs> the other languages really, they're very domain-specific languages, and uh, there's not good tooling, there's no Visual Studio for this thing, there's no, not even Emacs support for many of these things. There's no debuggers, there's no profilers, there's no refactoring tools, none of the things that many developers come to expect. So, <coughs> so what happened in the game industry in particular was that, uh, is that they could, it, it, it turns out that they could replace their, their, their their Lua or their Python with a just-in-time compiler. So they could replace a slow interpreter with a fast VM. So people that, you know, they would spend millions of dollars in getting, you know, getting another 0.1 microseconds out of uh, their rendering pipeline would be completely destroyed by the guy that is just making the, the, the game a little bit more fun. Uh, 
for example, the reason that Metroid only shows three enemies at once is because the fourth enemy made everything too slow, so they couldn't keep up 30 frames per second. So they limit the number of enemies on the screen, even if there's a stream of them, they'll keep it down to three. So, uh, you know, there's lots of hacks like that. <coughs> uh, those games like Common and Conquer, uh, they usually would have, you know, thousands of independent threads, and, and you know, you can, you can notice that as soon as you have too many enemies on the screen, the, the the game updates every, you know, maybe you get two frames a second as opposed to 60 frames a second. So, uh, so Mono kind of took off in the gaming space. Uh, it was a space <laughs> that we were not expecting. And in particular, the CMD extensions were not built because we thought it would be cool to map the CPU instructions to, uh, to the C <coughs> language, but it actually came from the game industry that, uh, that started rewriting a lot of their stuff, not only the scripting, but what happened is that the, although it started with the scripting, it's uh, you know, the C sharp started making its way into different parts of the game. And at some point, uh, and at some point, uh, it became necessary to do a lot of the vector math in C sharp without having to transition. So typically, what happens is you have your C core and you have your C sharp core. And uh, there's multiple ways of having these two guys talk. Uh, C sharp has this thing called P invoke that allows C sharp code to call into C, and it will do marshalling. Uh, it will uh, it will massage the data, call the C++ code, and then when C++ returns, you'll marshal it again and pass it to C++. To C -sharp. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, and, uh, and Alex, who's sitting at the back, is actually working on, uh, I didn't know you were coming, but he actually is working on, 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 a, on a simpler way of doing C++ to <coughs> .NET bindings. Uh, the traditional binding system is just support C. So, so another technique that is very popular in the game space is that you actually mirror the structures. So you can instruct C Sharp to have the, its data types have a specific layout. So you have a C++ structure and a C Sharp structure, and they have a one-to-one -one mapping. And the idea is that you can construct, for example, a, a game scene could be you have a building, and you have a cat, and then you have a dog, and each one of these is a mesh of vectors, right? And the idea is that if the structures are the same, if I keep my tree of my cat, my dog, and my building, um, I can just pass a pointer to the C++ engine. And since the structures are the same, the C++ engine can just translate whatever things I have that I manipulate on the C-sharp side, and they can up hand it off to the graphics pipeline. So as more, more code moving to C-sharp, what happened is that uh, when the cat needs to move, uh, you know, you have all these polygons that make up this guy, and you need to move. You know, you need to move it by a certain uh, amount, a, a 3D uh, transformation. So instead of having to do a call into C++ to do the transformation and then back, so each time you transition from one universe to the other, you have to pay, right? You pay some 20 instructions per transition, uh, on the way in and 20 on the way out, roughly. <laughs> and the more complicated the structure, the, the the or the more the more parameters that you pass, the heavier this is. So. At some point, if you you know if you want to move a hundred uh, hundred feet uh, uh, in a, in a little animal, uh, you know in a, I don't know the name of the animal, but if you have to move a hundred uh, components, uh, you would have to do a hundred transitions, right? The other option is that you completely avoid that and you move that code to C++, but then you're losing again, right? So now your high-level programmer has to learn C++. So the idea is, how do you empower the high-level programmer to keep doing his job and not have to and uh, not losing the performance, right? So you got the mono engine, fantastic, but now you're losing every time you transition. And that transition is uh, it's just as painful with Lua. So basically, the idea is how do you eliminate most of the bloat in this process? And that's where the CMD extensions came from. Uh, it was all about doing 3D manipulations of objects. Uh, it was also you could do as much heavy lifting in the, in the C-sharp world. We did a bunch of other things. Um, for example, one thing that Microsoft <coughs> Uh, hasn't done is uh, we turn our compiler into a library so um, so you can just say compile and you pass it a string and it will compile that and it will load into your same process right so if your code if you call something like uh, you say e it's basically eval eval for compiled languages so mm -hmm. imagine that you had eval and you can pass a C string and it will compile that on the fly it doesn't use uh, doesn't <coughs> fork it doesn't do anything it's all in process it compiles it and JITs it and run it in process. So we did that, uh, and of course we have uh, our read about print loop, so you have a little command line tool that you can use to type C sharp interactively. Uh, you can either do it on the command line or you can host it as a scripting engine. 
if you have a program or a game, in particular with games, you have your game and you can directly manipulate it with a C-sharp console. Uh, typi typically people just set up a socket and they connect to the game and they issue commands directly into the game. And again, games are per very performance sensitive. So uh, that was a big deal. We embedded Mono on the <coughs> iPhone, and like this time, there were, you know, we had like five games on the App Store when I made this presentation. Not very exciting today. It's like 1,500. Uh, we made a couple of other interesting things, like being able to remotely attach to Mono Virtual Instance. So if you had a running process, you could attach to it, and you can inject code uh, remotely. One of the things that we did is, of course, we injected the compiler as a service. So you could attach to a remote program, attach the compiler as a service, and then issue commands to a live uh, Mono program or a web server, for example. So uh, that is roughly when we started to diverge from things that didn't exist in .NET. And a lot of it was uh, driven by games. Uh, today, we've done a lot of other things. Uh, we kind of expanded from just these five apps for building games on the, uh, from the App Store. We've done fully, um, we've fully done uh, uh, bindings for Monotouch. And now there's thousands of applications built with this. Monotouch is. Just like GTK Sharp was a binding to GTK, and you could uh, build GTK applications for Linux, this is the exact same thing, but for building iPhone applications. Um, Mono Mac is the exact same thing, but for building desktop applications on the Mac, and Mono for Android uh, is the same thing for building uh, applications on the on Android. Uh, that logo up there, it's great on purpose, because I'm not supposed to say that those games are powered by Mono. Um, so I can't really show the logo. <laughs> uh, but all of those games are powered by Mono, so it has to be grayed out. The, um, uh, we also have a fabulous new garbage collector, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did with LVM for high-performance computing. Um, uh, well, I'll talk about that more in depth in, 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 with uh, this too. Uh, Sharpen or IKVM let us uh, either port Java code uh, to C Sharp, so it rewrites your Java source code into C Sharp source code, and it CSRPifies it in the process, right? So it, it changes the style, it changes the way the properties work, and so on. Uh, or IKVM is just a plain JVM. It's, it's a JVM implementation that runs on .NET. So you feed it Java bytecodes in one end, it transforms them, and spits .NET codes on the flight, and JIT compiles those ones. So, um, so let me tell you a little bit about code generation. Uh, typically, <coughs> the way that um, the way that uh, that uh, that .NET works is that .NET actually doesn't care about the programming language. It, it cares about this language called CIL, <coughs> which stands for Common Intermediate Language. That's all it really knows about. And uh, the C-Sharp compiler, we generate this thing. The Visual Basic compiler, we generate this thing. The functional language F-Sharp will generate this. I run Python, I run Ruby. All of these languages just generate CIL. Then you fit this through Mono, or, uh, or the JVM, and uh, Mono dynamically, what it does is it it, it compiles the code and sticks it in a block of read write execute memory, right? And that's a way that Mono has worked for most, uh, for most things, for the Mac, for Linux, for Solaris. That is how it works. Now, we did a couple of things. Uh, we have this thing that we call the ahead of time uh, compilation engine. I don't know what we called it that way. It's, in retrospect, it's kind of retarded. Um, it should really just be called batch compilation but I guess we're drinking that Kool-Aid. What is kind of <laughs> sad is that now the industry has adopted this retarded term that we came up with, and people refer to it as AOT. And it's really a really bad name. It really should be called batch compilation. But what we did is we, we, we added a batch compiler for CIL. There's a couple of tricks with batch compilation of CIL, because both CIL and the JVM are very dynamic. So. so so there's a lot of hacks that need to be in place so that we can completely, fully, statically compile uh, code um, using a batch compiler. So typically what happens <coughs> is that we cheat. We do a lot of the pre-compilation, right? We do a lot of it, but we don't do all of it. So we do as much as we can statically determine. We'll generate that code. And then for anything that we forgot to generate, uh, we still keep the JIT engine around. So. Uh, this is good for doing uh, for scientific code uh, because you can batch compile it ahead of time. You can do, you can use more optimizations, generate better code quality, and the startup time is improved. Right. So for desktop applications, you would do this. Uh, startup performance gets better, and uh, 
and you're basically kind of cheating and for anything that you didn't do you basically fall back the engine basically falls back to just doing JIT compilation like you did before <laughs> now the uh, the trick is that there's a couple of platforms that do not allow the JIT compilation system to take place so one of those is the PlayStation 3 the other one is the Xbox 360 and the other one is the iPhone uh, none of those three platforms allow the read write execute component uh, the stated the stated reason is that uh, it's for security purposes. Uh, I, you know, I've never quite bought into into that story, but that's uh, that's what all the vendors of consoles say. Now, uh, like I say, the pipeline is roughly this: uh, you start with uh, a compiler, C sharp, VB, F sharp, or whatever else, and this will generate some CIL code. And the mono engine, as it is today, either generates uh, just in time, you know. E Consume, you consume it with just-in-time code and it runs native code, or you batch compile it. Now, both of these still require the mono runtime. So the mono runtime still provides garbage collector, thread management, I.O., asynchronous primitives, all kinds of other features. Um, what we added recently, we're very proud of that, is this uh, LVM engine. So you still need the mono runtime. Again, you need garbage collection, thread pools, uh, asynchronous uh, notifications, all events, all kinds of things like that. But now we can we can use a higher quality LLVM. Uh, the reality is that the Mono, as, as proud as we are of our team, and the work that we did with compilers, uh, you know, we're only three guys, three guys working on the on the code generator, and and you can't really compete with LLVM where there's hundreds of companies contributing code directly to the code generator, the optimizer, and everything. So um, as of uh, last release of Mono, you can you can execute Mono, you, just, you pass a flag, dash dash LVM, and instead of running through the Mono code generator, it will run through the heavy duty LVM compiler. Now, it is very heavy. So if you use it for interactive use, you will notice it, it's very noticeable. Uh, for example, our c -sharp compiler rebuilds itself in two seconds, right? So you have C-sharp source code, the C-sharp compiler reads, uh, I don't know, 60,000 lines of code and generates the executable, right? So it has to load the code, JIT itself, and generate the code. That takes about two seconds uh, on my old ThinkPad T6. It's probably faster than this MacBook. And um, so it takes two seconds to do that. The When you run it with LVM, it takes 15, right? So the problem here is, when the compiler starts up, it activates LVM, and then LVM is going to make sure that it really fine tunes the code generated, and that takes about four, you know, 13 seconds out of this process, and then it runs very, very fast. Uh, so obviously, for something as interactive as your compiler, you don't want to use the LVM, but for uh, scientists and people in the finance industry, uh, having the choice of going with LVM is fantastic uh, because. They don't care about paying 15 seconds of startup time. They will get, uh, they will basically match C++ performance. Now, there is one case where we don't match C++ performance, and we had to add a horrible hack to the virtual machine to match C++. And, uh, and that is that Mono needs to ensure that any array access is within boundaries. So if you have an array of 10 elements, you try to access a, a element 11 or element minus 1, in .NET, you get an exception. You get an array un, out of, uh, you know, uh, out of bound access. The um, and the way that you implement this with the machine is basically every time you access an array, you have the compiler has to generate a little piece of code that says is the index below zero or is the index above the length of the array, right? So you always have to generate that chunk of code, and that obviously is very inefficient. So. But that's what guarantees that Mono is a safe environment. So it means that you know you, know, you can't you know you cannot do a buffer overflow. There are things like that that you can't do. So we added basically an unsafe option that disables completely that check, and uh, uh, we did it not because we wanted, but uh, because the scientists really once they've run the simulation in safe mode, if they're going to run this in a supercomputer for a couple of days, they don't really want to be paying the price of every array access doing this. So uh, it's, uh, you know, they're on their own at that point, uh, <coughs> but we basically had to add support for this, for these guys, for the finance people, which is kind of scary, and the, and the, scienti and the scientists. Then again, probably it should be scary the other way. You know, probably building bombs with that shit. Anyways, um, 
let me switch uh, subjects a little bit and talk a little bit about our, our, our vision of user interfaces and what we think people should be doing. Um, this is in part a reflection of our own failure to come up with a great cross-platform story. But basically, uh, this is what lets me uh, sleep at night. Today, there's so many presentation stacks that it's very difficult to come up with something that will run everywhere and will run and will look natively everywhere and will look good everywhere and will have a good user experience everywhere. Uh, I've listed some of the ones that, uh, that, that I could think of from the top of my head. Um, on Windows, you have uh, the choice of using the Win32 API or the WPF API. Those are the two presentation layers you can use from Microsoft. There are more, of course. On the, on the Mac, you use Cocoa. That's simple. Well, technically, you could also use Carbon, so it's a little, but let's just assume Cocoa is the only one. On the iPhone, you use uh, Cocoa Touch. On Android, you use the Android APIs. On Linux, you can use GPK, Qt. There's probably a billion more, uh, but I'm not going to list them. Um, uh, there's a Windows Phone 7 that uses a variation of Silverlight. Uh, there's Silverlight. Uh, you can <coughs> always have an HTML presentation layer. Uh, there's mobile browsers that use uh, whatever the thing it's called these days. Uh, there's XNA for video games. Uh, there's WebOS that uses HTML and extensions to HTML. And the playbook was uh, native UI Flash and Flex. And, um, and the reality is that you have a really a, a broad spectrum of user interfaces. There's very, little, uh, there's very little consistency there in terms of what you can do. Um, for some of those, HTML5 will be fine. Qt might be fine. GTK might be fine. Silverlight might be fine. But uh, at the end of the day, what we've noticed is that um, is that people used to bet their company in a particular presentation layer. They used to say, we're going to go with Qt, and that's the end of it. And the, the iPad, as ridiculous as it sounds, uh, because I know that you guys are not, uh, you guys are Linux users, but as ridiculous as it sounds, it's completely changed uh, the face of the enterprise. Uh, we're just talking to uh, some of the people in um, they just do this for a living. And what happened is that every big company, Target, Best Buy, uh, you know, all the big ones, uh, they basically rolled out iPad UIs for their business components of their company. Every big medical company, everybody now, every executive now carries an iPad with all of their software. And uh, it's, probably, it's probably driven because there's an emotional reaction to the iPad, but the reality is that uh, a device that didn't exist what it was a year ago that it came out. A device that has barely been on the market for a year has completely changed people's expectations of what software should look like. And although you can do wonders with HTML, people kind of expect their apps to look like Apple apps, uh, not like web pages. So, um, so we've been pitching, um, and like I said, these guys that we just met uh, the other night basically have built their entire business around this. Um, and uh, you know they're getting all of these guys, all the big guys, the medical companies, uh, Best Buy, Target, all those guys, uh, on board with this. But the idea is, you need to make your code, uh, act, you need to make it independent of your your UI, your presentation code needs to be independent from your business logic. Whatever the business logic for your application is, you need to split it. Um, you know, I don't follow this advice myself because uh, because I'm lazy, but and I don't really care if my software doesn't run in anything other than my phone. So when I wrote my Twitter, my personal Twitter client, because I want my Twitter client to have chicken noises, um, I, uh, I just built it for the iPhone. I don't really care about porting it to the Android. I don't really care about running on the, on the desktop. I just wanted my Twitter client for my phone. I didn't really care. I didn't really bother about other things. But if this is not your hobby, something that you're doing on the afternoon, you should really be thinking about splitting your code in these two. In particular, the guys that I was talking to, I hear consulting, um, uh, what they've done is a very nice system that lets them output HTML, so you still have HTML, uh, an HTML presence, you have an HTML mobile presence, so it still looks good if you go there with your iPhone, uh, but you'll also get a native experience with the iPhone, with the iPad, with the Android, um, and, and they obviously have a lot of Windows clients, so the same code runs on a Windows client and it runs on a phone. So, uh, so basically, uh, this is a pitch. Um, you build your application like this. Your business logic, and I call it business logic because people get confused with the other, you know, dozen names that exist. But, uh, 
the business logic gets uh, uh, needs to be independent of your presentation and whatever one of those is. You don't have to build them all, but you, you probably want at least to consider a Windows facade, a web facade, and, and maybe a, a mobile or a couple of mobile ones. Um, here are a couple of the things that we did. The mono documentation for um, the mono documentation. This is the our, our web UI. It's it's all coming from the same uh, same source. Is the web UI. This is the uh, uh, this is the GTK native uh, mono documentation. So the same documentation but rendered with native client. It does things. It has like built-in search and hyperlinks and history and all kinds of other things. Printing support, uh, prints for your machine. Uh, and this is the Mac version, and uh, it's very Macy. Uh, looks like the Xcode one. Um, one of our users built uh, specializes in conference applications, so he pushes. Uh, he works with conference organizers to create conference applications for their conference. He provides things like a, a program schedule, uh, uh, making sure that your program is up to date, rating of the sessions, comments, uh, maps to the conference, all kinds of things like that. And the, sh the, the code is about 80% shared uh, between the three platforms. There's a lot of data here. There's stuff that it needs to synchronize things. Remember, conferences change the schedule up until the last minute. Right, then they shuffle speakers, they add keynotes, they remove keynotes. So a lot of it has to do with uh, a lot of it has to do with synchronizing the latest information, uh, rating the rating the presenters, uh, last minute changes uh, from the organizers, and things like that. And about twenty percent of it is uh, is is uh, presentation specific. So there's three different UIs. Uh, the one in the middle is Silverlight, uh, with that whole thing where you pan around. Uh, where you kind of zoom in as you navigate the, the title bar changes. Uh, this is the Android one, and the Linux based one, and the one on the top is, uh, is the Linux one. You can, uh, you know, as you select these things, you can use the UI navigation controller on the top to get to the details. Right. So, so this guy followed the advice. Like I said, if it wasn't me, I wouldn't do it. But that's because I'm lazy. Um, so, anyways, um, I'm gonna skip this one, but. So roughly, this is what you want to do. Uh, this is why I believe that this is such an exciting space. Now, whenever I make a pitch that Mono is an exciting space to a VC, now that we're raising funds to, to create a Mono-focused uh, startup, uh, you know, every VC just says, why didn't you just use HTML5, right? So sometimes we have to explain that HTML5 has to be generated by something. There's got to be something on the other end that drives the HTML5. Anyways, the um, I'm just saying. Uh, um, although, although right now HTML5 is is uh, is still one of the biggest uh, uh, names in town. Uh, if you go to Stack Overflow, which is a developer website, and you look at the most popular tags, C# -sharp is still the number one. So I know that in the in the Linux room, this might sound like uh, like uh, you know like a VC told me C# -sharp is a legacy language. I'm like, hmm, right. Um, <laughs> But it's still the most popular language out there today uh, in the world. So, um, you know, of course, I'm picking that one. Other people pick C, and other people will pick Tayobi. Um, I'm just thinking, in terms of the activity that happens on Stack Overflow, is uh, is probably one of the most busy ones. Um, you could also argue, by the way, that it's the one with the most problems. So we don't know if it's the one with the most problems or the one with the most uh, activity. So. I'm going to leave it at that. It's still a fairly important language uh, either way, either because the most buggy or the most uh, interesting. So um, now, just to, uh, just to leave this thing, uh, we built recently this thing called Manos de Mono. And it's our attempt at, it's one of those attempts that we're, that we're taking at uh, splitting up a little bit from the Microsoft space. Microsoft, for the longest time, has had a uh, web technology called ASP.NET. And it's fine, ASP.NET MVC is, is really nice. But, um, but there is room for a different kind of web, uh, of web framework. So basically, if you guys are familiar with Node.js, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with Node.js. Is nobody <coughs> familiar with Node.js? Really? Well, I'm going to look like a genius. <laughs> no? Nobody knows Node.js? Oh, all right. So this is actually really interesting. Uh, ASP.NET and PHP and uh, Ruby and Rails and all of these frameworks tend to work with the idea that uh, you establish a connection to the web server. The web server will either spawn a thread or a process, will do your work, will query a database, uh, will probably mash up some data, mix two things, and output the page back. Right? The reality is that any 
is that web servers and web services are nothing but front ends to database. That's really what they are. Right? If you think about it in kind of sub terms, all of all the web is, is just front ends to databases. Um, now, this model this model is okay. So if you have a thousand people coming in into your website, you need either a thousand thread or a thousand uh, or a thousand processes, one for each one of these dudes, or you have the kernel kind of put them together and wait for me. So you have a waiting queue. You process them as fast as you can. You run maybe a hundred Apache servers or two hundred, or you load balance them. But that's roughly the idea. Uh, an incoming connection comes in and it uses a CPU thread to handle this, and then it returns. The uh, what Node.js does, and the, the credit really goes to those guys, not to us, um, but it's basically the same thing. We basically implemented the same functionality that Node.js did. And the idea is that instead of having one thread per connection, uh, you have one thread for all connections. So if you have 10,000 people coming into your website, you still have one thread. And what you use is basically select, or you know, the variation of uh, poll or epoll uh, that your system has, but you're basically selecting or polling or e-polling on 10,000 sockets, right? So there's a lot of connections coming in. You tell the kernel, let me know when the data is available for this particular guy. And the principle is basically, you still have one CPU. If you have one CPU, there's no point in having multiple threads. You can only do one thing at a time. So instead of having the kernel allocate two megs of space per stack, and instead of having fairly heavyweight context switching, you'll have one thread per CPU. If you have four CPUs, you'll have four threads. If you have one CPU, you have one thread. And, uh, and all they're doing is basically selecting. So you select on the whatever number of incoming connections you have, and the kernel will let you know whenever data is available. Right? And this is called evented I.O. And, uh, and the idea is that when you're developing servers in this way, instead of consuming the whole thread, what you do is you read some bytes, and if you have enough information, you'll carry on with a request. And if you need to do something like talk to the database, right, like I mentioned, you need to do a query to the database, instead of, uh, instead of calling the database and waiting for the database to respond, which would block all other 10,000 guys waiting for you, well, 9,999, 9, what you do instead is you do an asynchronous call to the database. So you write to the database your command, and you say, to the event system, hey, I have a file descriptor from the database. Let me know when it's ready. So you add that descriptor back to the 10,000 that were pending. So now you have 10,001, right? And as soon as the database responds, the kernel will know. It will be notified, and it will wake up again. It will wake you up and says, hey, your data for the database is ready. Go fetch it, right? And here's the buffer that I just got. So the idea of event-based programming is that um, you have a single thread, in this case, one thread per CPU, and, and um, and all of your I.O. is on this way. You're talking to the database, you're talking to the file system, uh, your timers, your callbacks, it's, everything is based on callbacks. You do something and you say, call me back here, right? Um, so um, it's, it's, useful, it's useful to keep this in mind because you might think, well, is, is, am I really winning anything? And, uh, and you know, these numbers are, are always good to keep around. Uh, you know, going to the disk is still <coughs> gonna burn it's going to burn a lot of time just going to the file system. So it might look that the disk is immediate. You know, anything that you access on this might feel immediate on your on your SSD or your laptop. But the reality is that it's going to spend, you know, light years uh, checking this stuff. So that's why uh, that's why uh, event-based I/O um, is useful. And this kind of ruin my uh, this kind of ruin my um, my formatting. But you get the idea. This is the ASP.NET way of handling a connection this is the low level API the most low level API that you can get um, and um, if you do it with the uh, with the HTTP way um, you have to do a couple of things you have to tell the server hey never kill me right because it might, it might be a long-lived connection so imagine that in this particular case what we're doing is is an HTTP server that will provide live data for example it could be stock quotes it could be uh, status updates it could be uh, monitoring an external device and you want to have on the client the JavaScript client that dynamically does something with it either update the display or stuff like this right um, uh, so you've seen Comet and Ajax all these things and the idea is you want to keep the connection alive and feed data to the client continuously and the problem with this approach in this particular case is a request comes in and I, I, I enter a loop and I basically you know write the new responses I flush it so that the chunked output notifies the client and then I slip. I, I could be doing something here. So this is my 
my business logic and then I give updates every whatever seconds, right? Now the problem with this while loop is that it basically just took one whole thread in the CPU. The CPU is not gonna be doing anything in this particular scenario. So it might look nice uh, when you're building this thing, but uh, when you go into production or you, or, you, you know, or you end up on Twitter or something like that, um, there's no hardware that will solve your problem. Uh, you, you're gonna need to use as many, as many dollars as you can buying Amazon instances doing this. And this is not only specific to ASP.NET, the same thing would happen with any other technology with that approach. The, um, the way that you would do it with, the, uh, with the, a callback system is instead, um, is instead you, would, uh, you, would, uh, you would basically call back and say, here's my, here's my response. Here's my response, and let me know when, the, when um, you know, I add a timer. And when the timer happens, it will re-execute your function, again, from the same uh, event loop. So I just showed you a little bit of this. Um, so again, this is not a solution. Um, this, in particular, is not a solution that you would want to use for a, a data entry application or other stuff that is request response driven. So if it's request response, use the old technology. It's fine. There's no problem. But if you're going to do things like uh, chat system, like data updates, interactive system, and stateful connections, you would like to use something like this. So it's not a solution for everything, but there's a class of applications today, maybe 5% of applications on the web, that could benefit from something like this. So this is not going to take over the world, and it's not going to uh, it's not going to uh, make you the most popular kid on the block. But it will, uh, but it will it will serve for those uh, situations. So, um, uh, like you know, this is an example that uses WebSocket. So what you do, and this is the same sample that I showed you a minute before. Um, in particular, with Manas, what you do is you make a call and you say, I want to upgrade my connection from a, a standard a request response connection. There's a part of the protocol on HTTP that says that requests that you swap the connection to WebSockets. So it will switch to WebSockets. And what happens here is that this is the way that you would build it now. Again, this is my business logic. I generate the data. Could be anything else. And I add a timeout. So I tell the system, hey, start a timer, and, uh, and let's get started in business. And what happens on the timer is I, I add my callback here. And my callback says, well, every half a second, right? generate the next number and send the data back in. And that's it. I say whenever, and by the way, when the connection is closed, just make sure to, to shut down my, my timeout. So you know, if the user closes the browser, you don't want to keep running this thing. So as soon as the user closes the browser, the kernel closes the socket connection, the socket connection is dead, and this thing is dead, right? Uh, but the idea here is that this doesn't consume a whole thread. This is the same thread that is used by the other 10,000 or whatever thousand connections you have. It's one thread, and it's just event processing. Yes? And the other code example. Yes. Uh, this one. Yeah. When yeah. you call sleep, other code can use the same thread. Uh, so this is not if you built it this way. Not if you built it this way, because remember you're stateful, right? So if I uh, if I terminate it here, I could, but then the request is over, right? And the sleep certainly other threads can use the CPU, but remember the way that it works is that a thread has a stack associated with it and a context switch, right? So I typically, it's two megabytes per thread of stack, mm -hmm. right? So this means that you're locking two megabytes of stack for nothing. So if you have another incoming connection, well, that guy is also going to get two megabytes. If you were to build a chat system with this on, on this lib, you're basically consuming all of the available system memory for stacks that are really not in use. So you have a lot of resources tied up with this. Mm -hmm. So it's really an, e an issue of resource usage. Uh, for this particular interactive use, it's a matter of resource usage. It's not, like I said, it's not. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not going to work. This thing works just fine, and mm -hmm. it will work great. The problem is that it doesn't scale. You have 10,000 people, and your only solution is to buy more Amazon instances or Azure instances. Uh, so it's not a solution for every problem, but it's a solution for this class of problems, interactive uh, applications. Um, and I can show you. Uh, you know, I can show you a little bit of. Um, Wow. Um, I think I, um, I need this. Okay. I don't know if this is going to render. Yeah, so this is a, you know, this is a small JavaScript application, and all it's doing is contacting the server and getting the data that I described. 
So this is just generating random data. It's a JavaScript app that plots whatever data comes from the server. Uh, if I kill the server, you'll see that it uh, it starts, it stops producing data. So uh, that's where it ends up. But that's the idea. This is the kind of application that you would build. It's interactive, and the connection is never closed, right? So these two guys, the connection is never closed. You keep it running the whole time. Now, if you have, and the idea is you could have a thousand users doing the same thing, and everybody's updating, and you don't want to be bound by how much money you can pay for servers for this particular class of apps, right? So, does that make sense? Are you convinced, or you still think I'm going to Google that up and refute him? No, I understand what you're oh. saying, but you 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 were originally talking about preserving threads, and now you're talking about preserving memory. Right. The reason why you care about preserving threads is because of the resources associated with it. Right. right. Okay. That's the only reason why you would want to do it. And the other one is context switch time. That's right. the, the only other reason. Um, yeah, I should probably have been more clear. Now, uh, I probably don't do as much justice to this presentation as uh, as the guys that do Node.js. They have a whole pitch in this. So I really. I really suggest that you guys look up uh, what Node.js is doing. Now, one of the downsides with this is that, as you notice, you have to work with these callback systems. So uh, this is fine if you're adding a time mode, but as the complexity of the program <coughs> grows, if you're doing a database connection, another database connection, another database connection, and you're pulling data from multiple sources, um, you end up with code that looks like this, right? So it starts to look very nice, and then the, your logic ends up being over here. And handling errors in these particular scenarios is one of the nastiest things you can do. If you need to percolate an error from here all the way to here, you'll end up passing uh, global, saying uh, variables, uh, adding checks so that you can bubble them up or cancel execution. It gets very, very nasty in both Node.js and Manos. So this is where we think that things are going to get very exciting. And we're not there yet. We're not there mm -hmm. yet. But we'll be there soon. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yes. I was, exactly. was going to say that's that. Oh, that yes. was beautiful. Uh, looking at how that works. Well, yes, I mean, the, the the whole async is just uh, right. It's so, so simple. C sharp five introduces. We don't have that yet. We're working on this, and luckily C sharp five has not been released. It's only been released as a technology demonstration. Uh, so you can try it out, but it's not available to the it's not available to the masses. Uh, they give a license so you can use it and you can build applications with this, but it's not official. And what is very interesting is that if you add this little keyword now to your method, so mm. this is a method that adds, uh, this basically thing is going to fetch two URLs, it's going to call those URLs, and those URLs uh, are going to return a number. And I'm going to add them. So imagine that I have in a web, web server, I have one number, another number, I'm going to add them up, right? So if I were to do this in the synchronous way, so this is a web service, you hit it. Imag again, it's like a database, right? Um, if I were to do this synchronously and ignore this for a second, you would fetch this one, and you're holding the thread, right? So if you have uh, like Apache uh, 250 processes, one, one of those processes is going to be stuck calling that guy, and if you're basically waiting. You know, your process is just waiting for the data to come back. And you, and you, know, you just consume the whole process. Then when it comes back, you're going to issue the second HTTP request. And now you're going to wait until that HTTP request is done. In the meantime, you, you hog the that that whole Apache server is doing nothing but waiting on this other guy. Now you get these two values, and then you return the value. So what it does here is it fetches the first URL, and I parse that value as an int, right? And I, I return this thing, right? And uh, the idea here is that I would have a GUI, and the GUI would say the sum.txt is equals the result of adding the, the two numbers hosted in those two URLs. Now, what is fascinating about C Sharp 5 is that by adding the async keyword here, Mm. Right? You tell the compiler, rewrite my code for me. And every time you do an await, it basically inserts a, it builds, basically it rewrites this method as a state machine. Right? So what happens is that at the point that it reaches the await, it actually launches this as an asynchronous invocation. It stops executing, returns back to the caller, so it returns here, and in this case the await also returns. So control returns to the caller. Now you go back to your main loop, you start processing other people's jobs, right? When the data is available, right, you wake up and resume execution and just say, oh, I have an event, you resume execution. And execution resumes right here. So it parses the value, right? So the state, so the state here was initially zero, now the state is one. Now you get here, you execute this value, you come up to here, you say, okay, the next state is two, and you suspend execution again, you go back to the main loop, 
you process some other requests from other users, uh, you send them some random data, and once the data is back, you resume execution, you come back into this function, it says my state is two, jumps back to this routine, adds the number, and returns the value, and returns again. Right. And so this is not adding any threads. This is not adding any right. threads. There's no threads. Right. Yeah. This is all. This is all turning existing code into a state machine. Yes. I'm a little unclear on exactly how much is being saved, though, because at the point uh, at your last line of code, when when the yes. uh, when the machine first encounters the await, mm -hmm. and then it, the, the thread sort of you know returns and then waits for an event to happen. Yes. Don't you have to save the entire call stack up to that point in order that you can come back to the code when an event happens? Right. Right, right. So you have to do that. And that, that's a separate call stack than all the other contexts that, are, that happen to be running at the same time. Right, but the call stack only needs to know where to resume execution, right? It needs mm -hmm. to have a function and a state. Yeah. That is the only mm -hmm. thing it needs to know. It's called a delegate. So you basically just have a delegate uh, and you invoke that back, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's basically f it's four bytes for the pointer and four bytes for the state. So it's eight bytes mm -hmm. as opposed to two megabytes of stack. Well, it still needs to somewhere hold the other intermediate values that are being gotten. Right, 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 right. Right, that's right. Oh, how do you do that? Oh, it's all preserved in uh, it's all preserved in um, in frames. So basically, of every variable that is captured, for example, this variable is actually uh, hoisted into a separate class, and v1 and v2 are part of a hosted variable that is referenced from the method handle. So everything that typically appears on the stack ends up being a class. Let me show you the machinery. So th this will make it clear. The machinery that does this again, like I said, the um, uh, this is not a sync because I don't have a sync implemented yet, um, but this is, it is exactly the same. Um, this is, uses exactly the same machinery. Uh, mm. <clears throat> this is used the exact same machinery for this. So I'm going to say for each bar x in full, so I can do this uh, object. X in full. Oh. So, um, so this printed one and two, right? So let's explore again what this thing was doing. This is C sharp. This is C sharp. So I'm saying for each object in invoking the method foo, right? So what happens is that I call the method foo, which is this one, and it says a, a equals one, yield return A. So this returns the number one. Now execution is suspended at this point. Execution is suspended, returns, right. comes back here, assigns that to X, and then I print X. That's where the, pr the number one came from, yeah. right? It comes back. Yeah. yeah. Then when I resume here, it calls foo again, but it's actually resuming the execution. So comes back here, resumes execution at this point, increments the value, and then returns the value. Now let me show you the generated code. Uh, it's going to be a little bit difficult to follow because... So the consumer is being called as soon as there's something to consume. Exactly. Yes. Yes, it is. So the machinery is the same, except now, now you don't have to use I enumerables. You can return any value. And the other thing is error handling is propagated in the same way that you've always propagated it. Right? With I enumer with yield, that thing that I just showed you is called, uh, it's called iterators. Right? So it's the same machinery, but now it's applied to a synchronous method. And it's a little bit more complicated. So let me show you the, uh, uh, let me try to get a bigger font, because we're not going to get a lot of, uh, let me see if I can get a, uh, a little bit better resolution here. Good luck with that. Oh, dude, you, I cannot believe that you can, you're doubting uh, Steve's. No, I'm doubting MIT's display. No, dude, this is Steve. Steve can do no wrong. <laughs> okay, so there we go. Let me see. Can we do something? What what can this thing do? Maybe this one? Mm. Oh, 
God damn it. All right. Uh, oh, oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. Confirm quickly. Like I said, Steve Jobs can do no wrong. All right. Um, I didn't want to say this, but okay. So let's take a look at foo. Let's take a look at the method foo and what happens to that variable a. Um, this, the, what I'm showing you is called CIL. This is the intermediate language that I talked to you about. So this is actually what happened to the method foo. Uh, okay. So the method <coughs> foo actually, which returns a system collections i enumerable, right? Mm -hmm. What it actually returning, what it does is it creates an instance of this class called foo uh, 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 backtick foo c underscore underscore iterator zero. That's what it does. Now, what is exactly in that class? So what's in that class is actually the state that we we're just talking about. So let me find the class for you. I don't know where it is. Oh, it must be this one. Okay, there it is. This is the foo, the tech foo c iterator zero thing. And what does it have? Well, it has three, it has three fields. It has a, right? This is a variable a, the one that I incremented. So this is the state. This is your state, right? So what it generated was a class that has a state, the PC, the program counter, that's the state, and, uh, and the current location of the program counter. And it rewrote the method. So the construction we can ignore. But this is what it rewrote the, uh, the, um, uh, the method as, which is going to be, pro it's probably going to be called move next. There it is. This is how, what it rewrote it as. Uh, is this the right one? No, this is not the right one. Oh, there it is. So this is how it rewrote the method. It actually hoisted it into a method called move next. Mm -hmm. We don't need to get into details as to why, but that's what it did. So what it does is it loads the first argument. Well, uh, that's that's how it goes through an enumerable as it calls yes. move next. Yes, I didn't want to get into detail, okay. but that's the reason. Yes, okay. with the await thing, it has to do it in a different way, uh, but it's the same principle. Uh, so what it does is it loads the field the PC, right, from the from the class, it loads a PC, um, uh, stores it location zero, which is its instance, uh, loads the first argument, which is this guy, uh, compares it with minus one. Oh, that's just to detect if it's at the end of the state. Otherwise, it does a switch and says, based on your state, go to either 25, 49, or 74. So state 25 is the first one that returns uh, load argument zero, load one. So this one it initializes eight to one. Um, and then uh, load field boxes it, and that's when it returns it. Right. The second one is going to be 49. And 74 is the so same. this is all the code is generated up to the point where a equals one is initialized, and it's the first value is returned. Yield. That's yield a. That returns the first value. A equals one. Yield a. This is the code that was generated. So what it did is basically it wrote a state machine. Um, this is the second thing. It resumes execution when the PC reaches the next value, right? So somewhere here it must assign the new value. Oh, here it is. It loads one and it's, it stores a new next version value. for the yeah. for the program count. So now I'm state one. So when it comes back here, it's not going to go to 25. It's going to go to 49. So it jumps to 49, right? And in 49, what it's going to do? It's going to do add one, add, and store it again. So this is A++. This thing is A++, right? Then this bis does. Um, Again, it does the same thing. It returns uh, it returns the a. This is the return value, the boxing. Then it stores the new uh, the new value for the PC, and it returns. And the last time, and the last value is 74. And all it does is basically say I'm done, and it stores it somewhere. I guess it stores in the my m m1 is minus one. So it says I'm done with this. This iterator is dead. You cannot call it again, right? So execution is finished. Um, so that's what it does now. Again, I'm showing, the, I'm showing you the machinery for iterators, which was introduced in C-Sharp 2. Uh, this is, in C-Sharp 5, they basically taken this same machinery and extended it to do more things. Um, and again, back in the day with iterators, uh, you had to basically manually deal with error handling. And if you look at our ASP.NET implementation, you'll see that we have to basically do the same thing. We have to percolate errors in the I enumerable pipeline, which is kind of ugly. I have a long blog post about that, uh, if you guys care. But what is interesting is that now the compiler will rewrite your code precisely to do this thing. So you continue writing code in a sequential fashion, but you need to annotate and say, this is a point where you need to become 
to make an asynchronous invocation. You can suspend execution here. If you don't say that, it will make it a synchronous call and then you're screwed. So you need to say this is asynchronous and it will rewrite that code for you. Um, <coughs> and again, I apologize for using uh, uh, this thing. This is my, uh, this is my wife's computer. I'm Linux less as of uh, Friday because I was laid off. Um, so, oh, that was it. So I'm done. Um, oh. All right, we can talk about a billion things with Mono. I picked a couple of topics for today, uh, but I could go on for days. So, um, you know, we can we can pick up any topic, and I'll be happy to discuss it, as long as it's not patents. Yes. Well, I'm particularly interested in um, because uh, right now uh, I you know I'm, I'm a mobile developer. Yeah. And uh, you know I was developing my, our you know our code base. Right now, we're, <coughs> you know, when I came in, we were uh, on Windows Mobile, actually, not even Windows Phone, Windows Mobile. Yeah. Enterprise applications. There mm -hmm. are some things that are, it's good good for that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I've been developing it so that it's, um, you know, would work. I'm trying to separate and get as much so that it's not dependent on anything that's not available in MonoDroid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And then, you know, when this all happened, what you know, because I'm on the MonoDroid mailing list. Oh, that I got laid off. Yeah. Yes. yes you know, so I, I saw all the... It must have been terrible not being able to respond, uh, you know, to those yes, all the all cannot, the people yeah. just. Uh, no, what do I do, you know? And then well, so there's a couple of challenges. Uh, you know, as part of me getting my severance, and everybody on my team, we cannot talk about a lot of things, and we cannot tell customers to come buy your products and stuff like that. So that's why you don't see us commenting because you know uh, that would be kind of a shitty deal. So. Uh, but what we've announced is that we will provide the same exact APIs of the stuff that we built at Novell. So we'll have the exact same stuff running on uh, in a couple of months. <coughs> but don't worry, I would keep using what you have right now and it will be the exact same thing. There's also a possibility that Attachment will sell us the rights, but uh, Attachment right now has a uh, $2 billion problem in their hands, which is they just bought Novell and it's, you know, Novell is a company with its own culture, and it's, it's, it's a tiny $100 million company buying a $2 billion company. So I think they have a series of problems to deal with. So uh, eventually, I hope to just buy the assets instead of having to rewrite it, but our plan is to rewrite everything from scratch. So right. I would just keep using it. I mean, I think it's a sound design, sound system. I like it. I, you know, I, we built it, so we like right. it very much. Yeah, I just, I just don't understand what their thinking is, why they would have done that. It's just, I don't know. Well. The way that my CFO described it was uh, Novell operate. I don't remember the exact finance words, so you'll excuse me if I don't, you know, if I get them wrong. But I think it's Novell had an operating 15% uh, operating income profit or something like that. I don't know the name exactly, but it means that uh, if we may, if we got 100 pesos into the company, 15 were profit, right? The rest was expenses, marketing, development, engineering, support, uh, payroll, legal, etc. And attachment runs at forty percent. Oh, so we Novell just wasn't profitable enough, so they cut out. Well, the one of, uh, it's uh, you know VCs called this. Uh, you know we talked to VCs, and VCs have a name for this called uh, it's, it's called surfing to the beach. And the idea is that when a company has mature products, right, they don't really need development. So there's a whole industry of software that is no longer that, that is only a cash cow. So all it does is produce money. You. You basically don't need to maintain it anymore. You only maintain it for key customers. But what happens is, if you invest more money in it, you're not going to make more money. For example, uh, I don't know if you remember Novell Network. Novell Network is a perfect example. Uh, if you look at the SEC filings, you'll see that Novell Network is still making $150 million a year. <laughs> now show me one person that still runs that. Right, but people need to get renewals. Uh, these things expire. They have a bug or a new driver that they need. So all you need to do is invest in the new driver, and that's it. And it still brings a buttload of money. But it's not. My it's not like just network. Let go of network like three months ago. You what? We just let go of network software about three months ago. You installed one? No, got rid of it. Yeah, got rid of it. So you know, it's a declining market. There's nothing you can do to save network, but it's still making 150 million dollars a year. Maybe next year we'll make 100, and the next one is 50. But that's still $250 million in your pocket. So uh, so surfing to the beach is basically when you take these products and you take out all the new engineering and you just keep support and just sell them into the uh, 
into the sunset. But why would they sell, you know, the code and sell that up? Well, that's what you're right, hoping for, right. I guess, because that would be the reason is because so they better. have a very big problem in their hands. They, I mean, it's a big acquisition. The mono situation is a tiny little bit on the radar. Yeah. It's not their top priority. Yeah. I mean, well, it's the rest of the think about they should think of all the other people who are suffering because of that. It's a very inconsiderate of them uh, for believe all the developers. Me, believe me, as uh, one of the layer fees, I am pretty upset about <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> about uh, yeah. about this, but it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. I'm raising capital, and uh, we will be incorporated tomorrow morning. So we'll be fully incorporated tomorrow with our Delaware thing or. Our, our angel funding. We have a big contract already in there from a new customer. Uh, so we'll be in operations shortly. Uh, very inconvenient. Yes, I am with you. Yeah. But that's but it's, it's good. It's good that. Uh, uh, but you know, the, the other thing is, uh, uh, I, I hope that this will at least dispel some of the myths that there was some evil conspiracy behind this thing. Uh, it was not Novell management. In any case, it was me. So I'm going to keep doing the same evil stuff <laughs> that I was doing at Novell, but now I'm going to start with no funds yet. So, um, you know, I'm raising money actively. That's why I was in California. I was meeting VCs in California. I'm meeting everybody here on, on Route 8 and the downtown. And, you know, I've been to Waltham more than I should, uh, talking to every VC firm in town. So, anyways, I'm excited about the future. I am very sorry about the way the touch may behave, but uh, you know, we got the boot on Thursday. Like, hey, by the way, we really like mono. We're gonna spin it off, but you're all laid off. All right. What if anything? Please don't post that to the web. I'm gonna be in trouble. Like I said. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what if anything does attachment now own that will adversely affect open source? Uh, nothing. Nothing really. Um. They own the LGPL version of Mono, so they they, they actively relicense it for uh, for embedded systems, uh, <laughs> set on box manufacturers, peace enforcement uh, companies that put Mono in peace enforcement devices. I don't actually know what it is. I just know it's some kind of tank. So it's running <laughs> some kind of tank. I hope that it's for peace. Peace enforcement. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, they refer themselves as peace enforcement. So, um, so there is that business that they still own and that we can't do anything about it. I, I would like to take over that business, but you know they have the rights. So I can do anything about it. Monotouch and Monodroy obviously were proprietary, mm -hmm. but as long as the open so the impact on open source zero, everything it was either MITx11 or LGPL, and that's why I'm able to actually go and build a new business with this. Um, so there's nothing they can do. Um, so. Thank you. And I'm going to keep doing this because I'm having a lot of fun. Again, these are a couple of topics that I picked. There's, it's a universe of things. Uh, you know, it's a 10-year-old project now. So there's, we got IDEs, we got debuggers, technology for profiling. It's, you know, it's a whole universe of really fun things. And you know, I can go for hours or bore you to death with details on, uh, on stuff. Yes? Who owns trademark? Uh, Novell does. Novell owns the Mono logo trademark, the Mono trademark, the Zemian trademark, the domain, the Mono project domain. I own GoMono.com. So I own the documentation, they own the wiki. Um, it's not a problem. I think that I don't really think they care about Mono. I think they'll just give it to us as soon as they have time. And if not, we'll rename it something else. Like um, Some people said that Mono was a poor choice of naming. It's unhealthy. I'm sorry? It's unhealthy. It's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so maybe I'll call it healthy next well, time. Well, that could be a new logo, is, is, is the, the disease. Organic. Maybe it should be organic. So, you know, who's going to say anything bad about organic? <laughs> <laughs> no. I'll just call it organic or something like that. But I, I don't think this is a concern. I mean, I don't think that's a problem. Famous last words. <laughs> Is it actually possible to develop iPhone software under Linux then? No. Well, it could be. Let me tell you why it's not. We, we haven't done it and why we only do it on the Mac. Because you get the simulator, right? So on the Mac, you get the simulator, and it's very convenient to make a change. Try it on the simulator. And like the Android one, it's very, very fast. So you try it on the simulator. Mm, no, let me change it. So it's a little bit like developing HTML5. You make a change, uh, run, mm, no, change, no, uh, no, 
So it's very <laughs> fast and directional. But if you if you depend on deploying to the device, every time you deploy to the device, it's like a 40 second wait, right? So you wait, it copies the file, bootstraps, reinstalls. So the simulator, in my opinion, is very important. Uh, so we could do something for Linux, but um, but you wouldn't get the simulator, mm -hmm. and people would basically say, "Why did you write a simulator?" And, and then we'd be like, yeah, "I don't want to do that in my life." So, <laughs> so that's the reason why we don't support Windows or Linux. Okay. Um, the second one, and it pains me to admit this, is even with our Android product, we didn't support Linux directly because supporting Linux is a nightmare. Um, if I had only built binaries for OpenSUSE, uh, I don't know what you guys run, but somebody would say, why don't you support Ubuntu? Why don't you support Fedora? Why don't you support CentOS? Why don't you support RHEL? And, um, and, uh, and that's why I kind of joke that 2008 was the year of the Linux desktop. I think that we as a community shot ourselves in the foot because mm -hmm. we as a community or the distributions all wanted to be unique. And Although there were attempts in 2000, 2001, 2002 to standardize the core, the yeah. Linux standard base, uh, it was never in Red Hat's interest at the time. Uh, Debian had their own policies. Ubuntu really is not interested. So um, I don't know what the status with SUSE was or what. I know that Caldera even participated in this many years ago. But the uh, but we we as a community hurt ourselves uh, because we didn't have a standard. So. Had we had a standard, we said, this is going to be everywhere. We're going to use this package manager. We're going to use this libc, this particular kernel version, this thing. We would be OK. But lacking that, it's it's very, very expensive to support Linux. Maybe for server apps, you can live with that, and you'll certify in a couple of systems. But desktops, you know, it's not even the latest Ubuntu. Some people have the long-term Ubuntu, mm -hmm. then some people have the current one, and the one six months ago, and some are a year ago. And everybody has valid complaints about why you should support, you know. If you go and ask everybody to say, well, you really should support the latest because, and somebody will say, you really need to support the one from last year because in organization, and they'll all have val very valid points about why we need to do it, and it's just very, very painful. So do you, do you think it's too late to not have a standard? Uh, I don't think it's too late, but uh, any changes in that space are probably going to take a few years to percolate. So I think it's still it's still time. I mean, we, we're just barely getting started, uh, but we're talking about a couple of years to get everybody on the same page. And it needs the willingness of Red Hat, Ubuntu, and uh, and Susan and whoever else is. I was involved a little bit in the purple of uh, Unix standards. I know how long it took for Unix to get standards and even yeah, commercial Unix you have essentially two major standards it's basically Berkeley and the uh, system 5 standards uh, Berkeley is primarily uh, the open group or X open it's written in Java uh, what? Write it in Java, so then it'll run a little memory. <laughs> <laughs> very funny, very funny. <laughs> um, yeah, something like that. Uh, I still think there's chance. Now, the, the problem is, that in my opinion, this is just a nice OpenGL Mac app that, that it's, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, the one thing that uh, I honestly think that the future of Linux today is with a strong vendor that can just get this everywhere. and. Um, as bad as it sounds, I think that Google is a, per, is, is a group that is going to make Linux on the desktop relevant. But it's not going to be in the form that we know it. It's not going to come in the form of GNOME or KDE. It's going to be in the form of Chrome OS. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it's going to be. Just because they actually, because GNOME and KDE basically were trying to fill the same void that Mac OS and Windows filled. Uh, but it, we still have the same system administration problems. We're not any different. We just have different sets of problems. Mm -hmm. And one of them is our incompatibility. And, uh, and Chrome OS takes a very different look at how computing should be. So I think that Chrome OS has a chance to, uh, a chance to become a very important player in the operating system business. It just won't be the Linux as we love and know, in my opinion. It's just my, you know. And I, and I, you know, I started GNOME, you know, so it pains me a little bit to, to see this happen. But, uh, but they have every budget necessary to make it happen. And they have every relationship to make it happen. Uh, 
Um, and the other one is Android, right? And Android already, you can you can argue that you're ready to exceed it. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, getting back to the iPhone, um, can you explain how mono happens on the iPhone? Because maybe I read too much FUD, but I thought Apple only wanted you using Xcode, only wanted you yes, using Objective-C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how how it happen happened is, uh, well, uh, we have, uh, you know, my developer team is really good, so we build that. So, uh, Wikicast, that is our trademark. Um, but uh, what you say is that uh, Steve Jobs effectively in April of last year, they said nothing but Objective-C and our JavaScript is allowed in the App Store. Um, you could argue whether this was aimed at Flash or at other frameworks in general. But what happened is that the Department of Justice got involved and the Federal Trade Commission got involved and uh, they interviewed pretty much everybody in the space, including us and including Aska Mobile, Unity, uh, Absolute, Titanium, PhoneGap. They went and talked to a bunch of people and, uh, and then they approached Apple and they said, I guess uh, we don't think this is good and we're gonna bring this forward. Mm -hmm. So Apple, unlike Microsoft, did the right thing and backed off. Uh, I guess the morale is you don't, you know, you don't fight the DOJ. <laughs> um, and if you're smart, you avoid it, and if you're not, <laughs> you go to court and then you, you end up with a consent decree. So, um, so that's, that was backed up in uh, September. So from April to September, it was fairly grim for everybody involved in the space. Um, but they backed out of that and they backed up a couple of other things, like the ad, uh, you know, the thing where they had to use Google Ads, I mean, Apple Ads only, you couldn't use Google Ads, or other things like that. So now the picture is you've got the actual mono runtime running on the iPhone and you're running CIL code. Yes. Well, uh, you never run CIL right. code, you run native ARM code. Remember the iPhone doesn't support read, write, execute pages. So mm -hmm. you can't just, you have to pre-compile every time. Okay. But you know, you run, you still run the GC, you still run uh, the class libraries, all the .NET junk is still there. I mean, all the .NET amazingly designed <laughs> APIs. <laughs> I didn't have to say junk. So you actually, for each chunk, you you compile. I mean, you, have a, you don't compile the entire thing all at once and stick it all in one chunk. Oh memory, no, right? no, no. As you as as you access certain pieces, you compile it and you stick it there, and then if, and then you leave it there. Right. Unless the memory needs to be freed up for some for well, another. Well, we piece use of uh, we use that linker. Uh, so the way that we do it, let me see if I can find slides for that. Um, let me see if these are good enough. Oh my God! I, it's just I did li I was editing these slides and I I mixed them up and I screwed them up so I think they're completely screwed now. Yeah. So this is what happens. So let's say that you have an executable, right? So your app and your libraries contain all of this. This is resulting executable. You have system, system XML, system web, web services, JSON. You have everything in there, right? And it turns out that you are only calling console write line. You know. And the reality is that write line needs what? It needs Unicode to translate your text into the correct encoding, it needs uh, streams, it needs a console class. So we'll run it through a linker, and the linker basically does mark and switch. It says, oh, you need a console class. Okay, what does a console class need? Oh, it needs this, 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 and this. What do these guys need? Oh, it needs this, 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 and this, and this. So it does a mark and switch, takes that, and it generates a new executable that only contains those pieces. So you end up with a minimal application that only contains the things that you actually consume, right? And what we do is that that's what we statically compile. So we run the JIT engine. I mean, we run the, the batch compiler on that. We don't roll it on this beast. We roll it on the resulting. So if you only have a console write line, we only we will only AOT the code. I mean, we only batch compile the, that code. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And there was some other question on the back. Yeah, I was curious about the comments about Chrome OS and the future yeah. of it. I, is it uh, it's cloud-based, right? Mm -hmm. So it sort of relies on you having the cloud. What about the parts of the world that don't have the cloud? It's not going to succeed in those parts of the world. Yeah. For now. <laughs> for, now. <laughs> for now. But, you know, the other parts of the world, you know, for years have historically had challenges. Like, um, you know, I come from Mexico. Buying a computer in Mexico, uh, just the taxes plus the whatever else. So if the computer here was $1,000, it's like, ah, $1,000, kind of expensive. There are two factors that play in Mexico. First one, the computer that here goes for $1,000 in Mexico City costs 2000 So first problem. Second problem, um, if the price for a burrito here is $3, in Mexico is 50 cents, right? And the salaries are adjusted likewise, right? So when a Mexican comes to the United States and wants to get a burrito, I'm like, whoa, $3 for a burrito, this is, uh, uh, you know, in Mexico I can get a, yeah, I can go to a fine dining establishment for this amount of money. 
for what you get here a really poor burrito. So those two factors come into place. The two thousand dollars for a computer in general for a Mexican. I imagine that every computer here in the U.S. Imagine that you go to the Apple <coughs> store and the MacBook here instead of being a thousand dollars is four thousand dollars. That's how it feels. So yes, Chrome OS will not get to those sites in the same. I mean, to some extent, since Chrome OS is a rental machine, you can buy it now for. I think you can pay forty dollars a month to get a computer. Just with that, those mechanics, it might be more successful, uh, and you know they'll bind it with some phone network. It might be even more affordable than just buying a computer outright. Um, so, anyways, I think that the the rest of the world had its own challenges on its own. Uh, so, there's gonna there's certainly gonna be a delay there in the adoption, um, but uh, the third world was always kind of screwed. <laughs> No, we should change that. I'm not saying that. I'm not justifying that. Hey, Linux is gonna. Is it ever gonna get more market share? Or Linux? Or not, yeah. Or yeah, of course. Like, I, I mean, the whole server space is dominated by Linux. I think that we didn't win the desktop battle, but we won the server one. It kind of sucks that I was on the desktop side of things, so you know, I kind of love that one. But uh, in better technologies, there's a lot of Linux there. Right, I think, and Android is everywhere. The nice thing about Android is that you, you, it's not only, it, it did start with phones and then tablets, but now it's in fridges, it's in printers, it's in displays, it's in, it's in everywhere. I'm sorry? Televisions. Got TVs, yes, it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. So, you know, I wish we could have replaced Windows and Mac OS, but it didn't happen. And, you know, it was our own infighting, and, uh, and there was also a little bit of what uh, Jimmy Zawinski calls the, uh, cascading attention deficit disorder uh, syndrome <laughs> and one thing that happens with Linux with us Linux people is that we don't tend to fix bugs in our existing software we go and say well this is architecturally broken I can do it better so somebody comes and writes you know <laughs> does it's like there's a discussion right now on the GNOME mailing list about this very topic uh, basically somebody didn't like the login screen because the login screen is tied to be known so he decided that one thing that we should do is be able to replace the login screen with different login screens. <laughs> so that's the first challenge. So somebody comes in and they make a pitch of why this needs to be done this way. Like, so the first argument is like, well, this is one sixth of the code. And then, you know, um, there's a reason it's six times bigger. But anyways, let's leave that aside. Then the second one is, oh, my architecture is better. Okay, because he can replace the greeter. All right, that's debatable. And the third one is you can put the greer. So, you know, I haven't participated in Linux development for a while, but this particular issue, you know, bothered me a little bit. And I said, well, there's a couple, because I was involved in the original one. And this bothers me for a number of reasons. The reason the this whole system is more complicated is because the login screen needs to be secured for multiple, for multiple kinds of attacks. There's dozens of XDM and GDM attacks that have existed over the years, successful attacks. And then there's theoretical attacks. So the code was made is, defen is is coded very defensively to avoid these kinds of conditions. This guy doesn't know any of this, right? So I said, you know, did somebody run an audit against every single bug and security bug that has been filed? No, it hasn't, right? So yes, the code is cleaner. You, anybody can do cleaner code, uh, but you ignore that there's a history of hundreds of bugs fixed, of security issues addressed. So. Um, so it's like what Jamie Zawinski was saying. The problem with our community is that we tend to just, well, this is shinier, this is nicer, and we'll rewrite it from zero. And it turns out that, well, you didn't fix the list of actual bugs that people had. You rewrote it, and you probably regressed in features. And that happens every single time. It's not, it's not even. And introduce new bugs. And introduce new bugs, <laughs> of course. And of course, it's like, and my main question is, why exactly would a user need a new greeter? Why didn't you change the main one? Why would I, what, what user benefit, what benefit to the end user is there to be able to switch the greeter? Hmm. It's something that you use. On my computer at work, I'm using the, whatever the Ubuntu greeter is, <coughs> and uh, I've got my displays turned sideways. Yeah. And when I used Linux Mint last month, the greeter was oriented vertically. And now with the brand new Ubuntu 11.04, I can't find any way to turn the greeter sideways. 
Right, so I think that so that's, that's where it comes from. It's actually the new grader and the new system comes from Ubuntu, and it's that one. Yeah. So, so you know, my concerns are the first one is security, and the second one, from a user visibility standpoint, <coughs> why do we need this? Don't okay. we have more? But I'm saying that the reason to replace it is that the one that's there doesn't do what you want. But maybe, but that's called a bug fix. I don't think that you need to replace uh, a sure. piece of secured, hardened software just because you can't rotate the screen. <laughs> what about I mean, having management? Call me crazy, but that's an if <laughs> statement. It used to be that way in my day. I'm sorry. Well, what about having management of, of uh, voting on things and like trying to get a central core of, of uh, you know, what everyone can agree on Designers. before someone actually starts doing something? Have it more organized and have <laughs> like some kind of a voting system or there something. Are some of the, it, it is, you know, open source has pros and cons, and this is one of those cons. We haven't been able to figure out a way of uh, of uh, governing ourselves in, in, in that way. There's really no shared goals, right? From Ubuntu's perspective, uh, you know, Mark wants to make Canonical the best Linux possible, but that means he doesn't. He can't really consult with the greater community what is best. And there's a whole GNOME shell versus Unity shell discussion right now. You know, I'm bored to death. I don't. I don't care. Uh, uh, Could you give us your summary on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can give you the summary. Um, again, this is basically uh, the Unity shell, uh, the Ubuntu discussion versus the GNOME uh, shell that was built mostly by Red Hat. Uh, my company, Novell, or my ex company, Novell, did not really participate in this, in either one of them. So I think that I'm fairly unbiased. Um, my feeling was that Mark wanted to have something that differentiated Ubuntu from the rest, and he wants to be unique in that way. Uh, and also, I feel that he wanted to be, uh, that he wanted to, to not have to double check with other people. But mm -hmm. Gnome Shell had a strong community development. It was community developed, and uh, you know, it, in my opinion, it's a beautiful design. It's all JavaScript powered. Uh, you can extend the shell. You can do wonders with that shell with tiny little scripts. So. Uh, in my opinion, it's a very nice shell, and I like it very much. And I also like the Unity one. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with both of them. I happen to believe more in the community approach of development than the, uh, than the imposed one from the top. Um, now, I'm actually not running a Mac. I'm not running out of battery. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, and the last thing I was using was I was still using GitHub 2, whatever is the last one, in, uh, on OpenSUSE. So, so I don't really have an opinion on that. I'm, I'm still kind of an OpenSUSE 11.2 user. I haven't really upgraded to the one of those. Um, but that's that's our problem in our community. Um, Mark wants to. Mark needs to make Ubuntu a successful company. Uh, my guess is that he wants to sell Ubuntu Canonical as soon as it has enough market share, and he needs to make it sellable. And um, you know, he already sold the company for a billion dollars. I think he's going to try to do the same. I think that somebody will want to buy Canonical for, you know, half a billion, maybe a billion dollars. <coughs> you know, you need to prefer the company for that. So. Anyways, it's a shame because it's not. It's, I'm not trying to blame Canonical here. It's uh, it's every Linux distribution. We did the same thing. We added improvements that we mandated from our side. That you know, then we donated and we said, you want to use it, use it. Eventually, it didn't get used. I think that the community tends to uh, tends to to trust more what was developed in public and got uh, consensus from everybody. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Please do. Please do. I'd love to have you. Miguel, they like you here. We don't charge anything. What? We don't charge anything.